Thanks for switching over, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to pick up where we left off in the part one of part two of our video on romanticism. I apologize for it being a little bit longer, but didn't want to rush and run out of time in that video. So if, if you click to part two of two, you're in the right spot. In 1798, Williams Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge published their landmark poetry collaboration, Lyrical Ballads, with a few other poems. It was with this publication that the Romantic period is traditionally said to have begun. The two poets who had first met in 1795 were united by their shared desire to explore new modes of literary expression. Wordsworth had traveled extensively in both Germany and France, where he had become committed to the revolutionary cause. He developed into a poet of the common man, writing to capture everyday experiences in simple language, without concern for artificial rules or conventions. For both Wordsworth and Coleridge, nature and meditation were linked with insight into the human experience, flowing freely from communion with nature. Coleridge explained that the poets in the lyrical ballads, excuse me, the poems in the lyrical ballads, focused on two aspects of human experience: the natural and the supernatural. Wordsworth nature poetry gave the charm of novelty to things of every day, while Coleridge himself explored supernatural events that nevertheless had a human interest and semblance of truth. In a preface to the work, Wordsworth would essentially define the features of English Romanticism, an emphasis on the individual, a rejection of artificiality in favor of passion, an emotion, a love of nature, a respect for the commonplace, and a freeing of the imagination. See page 780 in your textbook for more information. Lyrical ballads were, was so different from the usual 18th century neoclassical fare that Roman romantic essayist William Hazlitt likened it to the French Revolution itself. Soon after its publication, Wordsworth, who had grown up in the beautiful Lake District of northwestern England, resettled there in the town of Grasmere with Coleridge moving nearby. Along with their friend and fellow poet Robert Southey, they began known, became known as the Lake Poets. Also part of their circle was Dorothy Wordsworth, who lived with her brother in Grasmere and kept a keenly observed journal of their life. Another friend of Coleridge's, Charles Lamb, remained in London and won fame writing personal essays. Such essays, also called familiar essays, often appeared in the leading journals of the day. They were a popular romantic age form because of their emphasis on personal experiences and feelings. Other romantic essayists of note were William Hazlitt and Thomas D. Quincy. One talented prose writer of the era seemed largely untouched by the romantic movement. Instead, Jane Austen remained in many ways a neoclassical writer. She confined her novels to the experiences of the intimate world she knew, the genteel society of England's rural villages. Her novels, often called novels of manner, included Pride and Prejudice, Emma, and Sense and Sensibility. Austen's work does contain romantic elements, however, a focus on the details of daily life, and a preoccupation with character and personality. Also, certain characters, such as the passionate Marianne of Sense and Sensibility, are imbued with the romantic spirit. However, Austen typically causes such characters to see the error of their ways and become more reserved by novel's end. During the Regency, a second generation of Romantic poets came into the literary scene, the most prominent of whom was George Gordon Lord Byron. The handsome aristocrat won instant fame with the 1812 publication of the first part of his long poem, Child Harold's Pilgrimage, whose darkly brooding Romantic hero became associated with the poet himself. For a time, Byron was the darling of fashionable London, but his radical politics and personal escapades soon made him the subject of scandal. In 1816, he abandoned Britain for a self-imposed exile on the European continent, where he died of a fever while helping the Greeks fight for independence. Throughout the 19th century, he remained the most famous of the Romantic poets, known for much of his romantic life as his, for his romantic life as his poetic talent. The Byronic hero, dark, handsome, restless, and a bit diabolical, became a staple of literary fiction that many young poets and other artists tried to imitate. Byron's friend, Percy Bysshe Shelley's dismay at social injustice made him even more radical than Byron. An admirer of the philosopher William Godwin, Shelley scandalized London 
when he eloped to the continent with Godwin's 16-year-old daughter, Mary. He spent most of his remaining years abroad, writing the verse dramas The Sensi and The Prometheus Unbound, as well as beautiful lyric poetry that celebrates nature, freedom, artistic expression, and other values the romantics held dear. After Shelley died in a boating accident at age 29, his wife Mary Shelley returned to England where she helped edit her husband's works for publication. Mary Shelley was a talented writer who won fame in her own right for her gothic horror tale Frankenstein. Mary moved into intellectual circles and was familiar with the scientific theories of her day. In her introduction to Frankenstein, she describes listening to conversations about Dr. Darwin, who preserved a piece of vermicilia in a glass case till, by some extraordinary means, it began to move with voluntary motion. Not thus, after all, would life be given. Perhaps a corpse would be reanimated. Galvanism had, had given token of such things. Thus, Shelley's dark tale of a monster who destroys its maker could, not, could be read not only as a horror story or a romantic meditation on passion versus reason, but as a warning against the dangers of science. Indeed, Frankenstein's monster can be seen as the embodiment and expression of Shelley's society's fears, fears of unchecked progress and of science and industry's negative effects on humanity. Poet John Keats came from humbler origins than Byron and Shelley. He was acquainted with Shelley, however, through his friend Leigh Hunt, the publisher who encouraged his career and introduced him to leading artists of the day. Orphaned at 14, Keats spent much of his short life fighting the tuberculosis that killed his mother and brother and eventually claimed him as well. He produced some of his finest poetry in a feverish eight-month span, sonnets, odes, ballads, and other poetic forms, all handled with remarkable dexterity. Many of his poems used vivid images from nature as a starting point for philosophical meditations about joy, sorrow, love, death, art, and beauty. After Keats died, Shelley eulogized him in the most famous elegy, Adonis. His fate and fame shall be an echo and light unto eternity. With this, folks, we move back into some poetry of the Romantics for our unit. This unit will keep us for a few weeks as we move through. Be sure to reach out to your instructor if you have any questions. Be sure to fill out those Cornell notes as completely as possible, and we'll see you next time.